We are now live. Hello. Um, uh, welcome to those who are just joining us now. Um, my name is Paul Reynolds. I'm your moderator this afternoon for this uh, meeting. Uh, so welcome to this discussion of Turkey in a changing global and regional security environment uh, uh, with Turkey's Minister of National Defense. Uh, this event is organized by the Center for British Turkish Understanding, uh, otherwise known as the CBTU. Uh, a bit about myself briefly, um, I work independently in economic, governmental and international relations reform. 70 countries so far and counting, uh, including Turkey, a country which I uh, dearly love, uh, and much of my work is focused on countries in, in conflict. Uh, we at the Centre for British-Turkish Understanding are extremely grateful and honoured to have with us uh, today Turkey's Minister of National Defence, Hulusi Akar, joining us uh, and giving, us some, uh, giving up some of his valuable time uh, in his extremely uh, busy and hectic schedule. Uh, and of course, we thank him for speaking in English for those of us who don't speak Turkish here today. Um, uh, and uh, the chairman of the CBTU, Abdurrahim uh, Boyne-Klein, will uh, introduce the minister more fulsomely. Um, uh, myself being a board member uh, of the CBTU, uh, of course, I must thank uh, the chairman um, of the CBTU, Abdurrahim, uh, Abdurrahim uh, Boyne-Klein, and executive director, Dr. Abdullah Falik, for setting up this important and timely uh, meeting. Uh, so thank you to um, Abdurrahim and Abdallah. Uh, the uh, Center for British-Turkish Understanding has a valuable role in exploring uh, relevant foreign policy challenges faced by both Turkey and the United Kingdom, especially where they uh, intersect. Uh, thus, uh, the CBTU aims to strengthen the foundations of the UK-Turkey relationship and deepen cooperation on issues of mutual interest. Uh, indeed, uh, especially important at this time of rising uh, global tensions and uh, 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 a time of rising tensions in, in what the British call the Near East, as you might call it. <clears throat> uh, this webinar is part of a, an ongoing series from CBTU, uh, and it's an opportunity today to I hear directly from the Turkish Minister of National Defense about Turkey's role and strategy, especially in some of the conflict arenas where Turkey seeks to bring uh, peace and prosperity uh, admirably. Uh, as a regional power, Turkey is increasingly seen as a strategic ally for both its neighbors and world powers pursuing conflict uh, resolution, stability, and peace. And today we can explore what this may come to mean in the future as events develop with the Honourable Minister, uh, whose talk is informed by uh, a number of questions which have been put to the CBTU uh, in recent days. Um, may I just quickly introduce uh, uh, the chairman of the CBTU, uh, Abdurrahim uh, boyne -Klain, is who is a former Turkish Member of Parliament and Deputy Minister. Uh, he was in fact head of the AK Party Youth which has over 4 million young uh, members across the, the nation. Uh, he's currently the chairman of the AK party, United Kingdom. And for now, I will hand over to you, Abdurrahim, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Paul Reynolds for uh, moderating today's meeting. Uh, thank you for asking me to share a few words. Oh, well, on behalf of CBTU, it is indeed a great honor to have the Minister of Defense of Turkey, Hulusi Akar, join us in this meeting. Uh, we very much look forward to his insights and uh, perspectives on the theme of today's meeting. Uh, Minister Akar, you have an impeccable and illustrious record of military service and you have been committed to protecting Turkey, its citizens and Turkish interests globally. Uh, with this comes your passion and commitment uh, to promoting peace, security and conflict resolution around the world. Uh, it is for this reason that the Centre for uh, British-Turkish Understanding extended an invitation to you to speak to us uh, about these and other issues. Uh, we are truly grateful to you for finding 
the time to join us now, despite your uh, extremely busy schedule. Uh, thank you, Minister Akar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lenas, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian Callum, for your uh, uh, invitation for this uh, webinar. This is uh, a great uh, uh, opportunity for me as well uh, to inform, express our uh, 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 thoughts and uh, to share with our uh, feelings with our uh, participants. Thank you. Uh, dear participants, uh, and the ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and the greetings from the uh, Turkish Minister of Defense to all of you in the United Kingdom and the any place of the world. I would first like to thank the uh, Center for the British Turkish Understanding, CBTU, uh, for the invitation to speak at this event. I hope that uh, this event will contribute to a better understanding of the several challenges faced and the contributions made by Turkey in its region in the transatlantic uh, area and beyond. At the outset, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my deep condolences and heartfelt sympathies for all the losses due to COVID-19 in the UK and elsewhere. The pandemic has demonstrated that all of humankind is on the same boat. In Turkey, our response to the pandemic has proved to be broadly effective. We, as the Minister of Defense contributed to this effort by gearing some of our facilities to produce medical supplies for our nation as well as for other countries. Turkey has so far extended assistance to almost 150 countries. As an example, Turkey provided a plain load of medical supplies and personal protective equipment to the UK once again, proving that it's a reliable friend and partner. The ties between Turkey and the UK have a very deep rooted historical background. We have the same or similar positions on many global issues. Our economic relations are also extensive. Our cooperation, especially in the defense industry is promising. After Brexit, the UK has become a non-EU NATO ally, like Turkey. Uh, with that, I believe that our bilateral relations and strategic partnership with the UK will align more than before on common risks and new collaborative opportunities. Dear participants, in the first two decades of the 21st century, uh, we have entered a more unstable and unpredictable global security environment than ever. This environment presents challenges to the traditional rules-based security order. Conventional threats are accompanied by increased risks such as terrorism, extremist ideologies, failed states, frozen conflicts, mass and irregular migration, and climate change. While the risk of state-on-state -state conventional warfare has decreased, we are currently being challenged by new hybrid threats. War was primarily a state activity in the past. Now, with more state-like actors and proxies, this distinction is increasingly becoming blurred. Hybrid and cyber warfare pose significant challenges to the old school military domains of land, sea, and air. We also need to focus on other emerging and disruptive technologies, such as artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and autonomous systems. Transnational terrorism is also on the rise. No country, society, or individual is immune from the reach of radical, violent groups and uh, individuals. Terrorists use social media to recruit vulnerable individuals, spread their ideology, and even share real-time footage of their horrible acts to induce a shock effect for propaganda purposes. Or sometimes they use fake news, photos, and videos, as you know. 
Another area of competition is in the domain of information technologies. Nowadays, every little gadget in our pocket is producing and collecting massive amounts of data. The availability of such massive data and computing power, uh, power force decision uh, make us uh, to review traditional norms, procedures, and structures. Here, the quantum age of computing is coming into play as both a possible risk and also as an enormous opportunity. In short, as the saying goes, technology remains as the proverbial double-edged sword. Effective multilateral cooperation between friends and allies is essential to find solutions to all these issues. Dear participants, as the cornerstone of transatlantic security, we firmly believe the role of NATO is more vital than ever. Contrary to the claims of being irrelevant or brain dead, brain dead, NATO has continued to successfully adapt and grow in the face of diverse and emerging threats. Turkey will continue to strongly support this adaptation as she has done in the past. Despite certain disagreements, Turkey and the European Union share long-term interests on a wide range of topics, including security and defense, countering terrorism and preventing illegal immigration. Membership in the EU still remains our strategic objective. In fact, a comprehensive approach to European security is simply not possible without Turkey or the UK. But unfortunately, there is a lack of strategic vision on the part of the EU. Sorry, I have to say this. By linking every aspect of our relations to the Cyprus issue and Eastern Mediterranean, the EU allows our common agenda to be hijacked by certain members, including those that should never have been allowed in the EU in the first place. And by that, I mean the Greek Cypriot administration. Yet, his, uh, yet this uh, lack of vision in the EU is not unfamiliar to the UK. I believe we see it also in the Brexit process. Ladies and gentlemen, Unlike the possible risks to certain other parts of Europe, threats against Turkey are not just a theoretical possibility. They are real, direct, substantial, and unfortunately, lethal. As the Secretary General of NATO has stated, Turkey is at the forefront of a very volatile region. No other ally has suffered more terrorist attacks no other ally is more exposed to the instability, violence, and turmoil from the Middle East. And no other NATO ally hosts as many refugees as Turkey does, many of them coming from Syria. As you all know, Turkey has fought with determination for years against all forms of terrorism. Today, we are conducting a relentless and resolute struggle against Daesh, also known as ISIS, and the PKK, PYD, YPG, as well as uh, Fethullah's terrorist organization, all at the same time. The PKK, a terrorist organization that has also been outlawed in the UK, has killed more than 40,000 40, of our citizens. The PKK is maintaining an active presence in Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria, as well as in some European countries. The PKK is misleading the international community by using different names. We have to be careful. The PKK, KCK, PYD, YPG, PJAK, uh, YBS, and YJS 
are all the same terrorist organization with the same ideology. The Syrian crisis gave the PKK the opportunity to promote the YPG, its branch in Syria. The key issue here is this PKK equals YPG. They share not only the same ideology, but also the same leadership, same methods, and the same training camps. When some of our allies started to supply the YPG, we warned the, against the risks of the trying to defeat one terrorist threat by employing another. The PKK is now widely recognized as a terrorist organization, but it took far too long for this fact to sink in among our friends and allies. Now, the same dilemma also applies to the classification of a YPG as a terrorist organization. Regrettably and deplorably, the YPG continues to receive substantial support from some of our allies. On the other hand, the Kuwait, the Kurds in the region with the PKK YPG is an insult to our Kurdish brothers and sisters. I must underline that we had no problem with neither the Kurdish people nor any other ethnicity. Our only enemy is terrorism and terrorists. Turkey has also actively participated in the global coalition against theirs and has paid a heavy price for it. This is why Daesh has attacked Turkey and caused the loss of almost 600 innocent lives of the Turkish people. I should emphasize that the Turkish Armed Forces is the only coalition army to have fought hand-to-hand -hand against Daesh. In Syria, Iraq, and Iraq, the 3,700 of the most radical Daesh militants were neutralized by Turkey, by Turkish Armed Forces. We lost many brave Turkish soldiers in these operations. I would like to particularly stress that attempting to affiliate terrorism with any religion or ethnic group is utterly wrong. Doing so would, in fact, play into the hands of terrorists. Daesh does not represent Islam. Daesh, terrorist organization, does not represent Islam, just as the PKK, YPG, does not represent the Kurds or Kurdish brothers, sisters. Another active really serious uh, threat for Turkey is the Gulenist terrorist organization, also known as FETÖ. The failed coup attempt on July 15, 2016, was a test of strength and resilience for the Turkish democracy and the state. This year, we commemorated the fourth anniversary of the deplorable failed coup attempt. You will remember that FETÖ's disciples within the armed forces ruthlessly used lethal force against innocent civilians, killing 251 and wounding 2,193 citizens. Among our heinous acts, they attempted to assassinate the elected president, our president, and bombed our parliament. FETÖ is still active throughout uh, its uh, network of schools, media entities, and associations around the world. The Turkish government has rightfully taken the necessary legitimate and uh, proportionate measures to defeat this threat and bring those responsible to justice. I should emphasize that the Ministry of National Defense and our armed forces have become stronger with the measures taken since the coup attempt. We are determined to fight such enemies of democracy through democratic means. In this context, we wish to see friendly and allied countries take concrete action against members of this terrorist group organization, including by responding to our extradition requests for its members. This is very important. The UK was the first European country to condemn this attack 
on our democracy. That display of solidarity will not be forgotten. However, now more needs to be done to bring its members to justice in the aftermath of the coup attempt. Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned Syria in the context of our fight against terrorism. Let me now say a few words on the wider Syrian crisis. The Syrian crisis is the bloodiest conflict in the region since World War II. Since 2011, we have been warning the international community that Syria would become a quick march. Looking over the last nine years of this Syrian crisis, I believe we can safely say that Turkey has done more for the Syrians than any other country. As Turkey, we have stood with the Syrian people since the beginning of the conflict. We have embraced millions of Syrians, including Ezidis, Arabs, Christians, Assyrians, and many other minorities, regardless of their ethnic identity or faith. We are hosting currently 4 million Syrians at a cost of at a cost over for the billion dollars, for the billion dollars. We are the largest refugee hosting country in the world, according to United Nations figures. We are also providing aid and assistance to 3 million internally displaced people within Syria. So far, uh, more than 300,000 Syrians have returned to the areas that Turkey has cleared of terrorists in counter-terrorism operations. The ceasefire we established in the province of Idlib in March is holding despite sporadic violations. This uh, ceasefire is essential in order to improve the humanitarian situation on the ground, prevent another refugee flow towards Turkey and Europe, this is an important point, and revitalize the political process. In this regard, we are encouraging all our partners to pay more attention to the political process and to support humanitarian aid efforts. Ultimately, we wish to see a stable and the democratic and politically united Syria as our neighbor. Dear friends, in Libya, it has been more than a year since Haftar and his forces launched an offensive against the country's legitimate United Nations recognized government in Tripoli. Haftar, who is financed by the United Arab Emirates and supported by Egypt and Russia, has relentlessly worked to undermine the prospect of lasting peace and stability. His forces, supported by mercenary groups, had indiscriminately shelled hospitals, ports, airports, schools, embassies, residential areas, and medical supply depots, and elsewhere. In the areas cleared from the Haftar's forces, numerous mass graves and hundreds of human remains have been uncovered. Turkey's primary objective is an independent and sovereign Libya, led by the Libyans and embracing all Libyans with its territorial integrity and national unity intact. Turkey is providing trained assist and advice support upon the request of and based on a bilateral agreement with the legitimate Libyan government. We are the only country to provide concrete support in response to the call for help by the Libyan government. Our support is widely recognized to have changed the balance on the ground and paved the way for diplomatic efforts like the Berlin Conference. Without our assistance, Tripoli might have fallen to Haftar's forces, leading to a major humanitarian disaster. As we all agree, there is no military solution to this issue. We are very much aware of this. We hope that United Nations efforts and the uh, recent ceasefire declarations in Libya will lead to a lasting political solution. Dear participants, turning to the Caucasus, 
with its latest attacks this week, Armenia showed once again that it remains the greatest obstacle to peace and stability in the region. We strongly condemn these attacks, which constitute a clear violation of international law. The illegal occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh and its surrounding regions has led to over 1 million internally displaced people in Azerbaijan. In order to achieve peace and stability in the region, the Armenian occupation of these areas has to end. Turkey stands in solidarity with and will continue to support Azerbaijan as it protects its people and territorial integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean seas, there are a number of outstanding disputes, unfortunately. The core of these disputes are the excessive and unilateral claims by Greece and Greek Cypriots, which violate the sovereign rights of both Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots. For example, in the region, uh, in the Aegean Sea, Greece has violated international agreements by undermining the demilitarized status of the islands. The international press reported that Greek soldiers were being transferred to the island of uh, Mace or uh, Castellaritza, which is only about less than two kilometers away from the Turkish uh, coast. This island is to be demilitarized according to the 1947 uh, Paris Peace Treaty. Not only within this treaty, but also the, there are uh, many of the legal documents relating to this issue. Furthermore, Greece claims territorial waters of six miles, while their airspace claim is for 10 miles. This is a one of a kind approach and is only asserted by Greece in the whole world. This is also the pretext for her allegations regarding the so-called airspace violations. Turkey has the longest continental coastline in the Eastern Mediterranean with a length of almost 2,000 kilometers. However, Greece and the Greek Cypriots are trying to impose their own maritime boundary claims, thereby trying to confine Turkey strictly to her coasts. Unacceptable. This is unacceptable. Furthermore, Greece claims a conventional continental shelf area of 40,000 square kilometers for the tiny island of Maze, which has an area of just 10 square kilometers. This island is about 600 kilometers away from the Greek mainland. It is obvious that such claims are neither realistic nor fair. On the other hand, I can assure you that Turkey has no intention of violating any country's legitimate rights and interests. Despite these differences, I would like to firmly underline that as Turkey, we are in favor of resolving all the outstanding problems with Greece through international law, good neighborly relations, mutual goodwill, respect, dialogue, and negotiation. All we are asking from our friends and allies is for them to look at Greece's claims and practices in the light of logic, science, and objective criteria, and compare these to Turkey's legitimate, reasonable, and common sense approach. Finally, on the Cyprus issue, the core problem is that the Greek Cypriot side still aims to reduce the Turkish Cypriots to the status of a minority in their own homeland. A solution to the Cyprus issue is possible only by accepting the fact that the Turkish Cypriots are the co-owners of the island. As a guarantor country, Turkey will support any solution that will guarantee the security of the Turkish Cypriot people their historical and equal uh, political rights, as well as their equal uh, entitlement to the uh, natural resources 
on and around the island. And the UK, as another guarantor state, can and must play an impartial, balanced, and active role in the search for a solution to the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, to sum up, as Turkey, we will continue to fulfill all our responsibilities and contribute to peace and security in our region and world. In doing so, we wish to work with our allies and friends, among whom the United Kingdom ranks prominently. Turkish troops deployed in countries such as Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kosovo, Lebanon, and at sea, often work side by side with UK soldiers. Turkey, complementing its efforts in the diplomacy, defense, and security areas, ranks among the top contributors globally in terms of development and humanitarian assistance. The international community should adopt the same principle and decisive stance against all terrorist organizations. In resolving disputes, we always prefer diplomacy, peaceful solutions, and dialogue. All that we ask from our friends and allies is that they look at the issues fairly, objectively, impartially, with intellectual honesty, and without any prejudice and uh, preconceived notions. In concluding, I would like to once again thank the Center for British Turkish Understanding and wish it uh, all the success in further advancing cooperation, a mutual cooperation between Turkey and the uh, United Kingdom. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you. I think you need to unmute yourself. Uh, we can't hear you yet. Yeah, I want to uh, very much thank the minister for his uh, excellent uh, exposition and particularly to thank him for his uh, clarity of thinking and directness, uh, which uh, helps us understand clearly uh, the Turkish uh, position. And uh, it's a, a very much a tour de force. Uh, you have addressed the issues of the conflict in, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, issues related to Greece and Cyprus, Libya, uh, Kurdish issues in Syria, Iraq, and Turkey and elsewhere, uh, Turkey's intentions in Syria, uh, the role of NATO, and even uh, touched on the UK after Brexit, close to the hearts of people here in uh, London. So with that, we, uh, this is an extremely uh, direct, helpful, and clear uh, uh, statements of intent and policy. So uh, I thank the minister for this and I thank the minister for finding the time to spend with us. Uh, and uh, thank you also to the webinar audience uh, here with us today, listening from different parts of the planet. And uh, uh, just uh, say something about uh, CBTU, uh, working as it does to advance better understanding between the UK and Turkey made much easier when we have such clarity of thought, I have to say. And hopefully this event is another step in uh, the direction of peace uh, and stability. Um, may I also, I'm sure that uh, uh, Rahim may wish to say something, but may I just uh, say something about CBTU? Um, uh, please look out for future events of the organization and publications, which you can find at uh, cbtu.org.uk. Uh, may I also say that a recording of this event will be available on the website of the organization. Uh, and just uh, finally, in passing, uh, en passant, as we say, um, please also read a recent article by uh, Dr. Shevdet Yilmaz on Turkey's fight against the uh, uh, C-19, as people call it, the coronavirus, which was published just a few days ago, also available on the website. Uh, so with that, I'll just pass to Abraham uh, to make some closing remarks, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, 
uh, again to direct this webinar and uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, to have uh, time with us uh, in your really extremely uh, busy schedule. Uh, it was extremely uh, insightful uh, meeting webinar uh, and we pretty much, Mr. Minister, uh, has talked about the all uh, issues and intentions uh, about the region uh, from the Turkey's perspective and approach. Uh, as Professor uh, mentioned, uh, please follow us from uh, CBTU.org and uh, our Facebook and Twitter uh, websites and links uh, for the same uh, programs that we will that we want to contribute uh, to the understanding of uh, British Turkish uh, spectrum. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Professor uh, Reynolds, uh, thank you, uh, Abdurai Bolukalan, for this opportunity. And then the, I wish the every success you know, for those the, uh, working within the, the CBTU. And the uh, special thanks from Turkey to United Kingdom, the uh, Stefan Sacker the, of the BBC. And the, he met you know, the great you know, the example of you know, the behavior just you know, the, two days ago you know, within this you know, the, uh, program while he was you know, discussing the issues. It is very, very important to show you know, the intellectual honesty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.